Thank you to Prusa Research for sponsoring my coverage of Earth 2019. The new Prusa Mini comes with a not so mini 18 cm cubed build volume, a heated magnetic PI spring steel flex bed, and an all new 32 bit electronics platform with the newest dynamic drivers, a full color LCD screen, and networking built right in. And best of all, it's only $349. Check out the Prusa Mini at the link below. What? Well, this is just basically an example of how far you can scale a tool changer and have it still work. Um, it's got 13 heads. It's it's ludicrous, but it's fun. Okay, so it's built from conduit tubing. It looks like it's built from uh, plywood on the outside. This seems to be a pretty low cost build even. It was, it was very low cost. The actual frame and motion system is based on Alex's Piper 2 system. All right. uh, we did the tool changing and obviously built it into the electronics and everything else. So electronics wise, what does it run? It runs Clipper with five ramp sports. Okay, how, how does that, I've never used Clipper in like a productive way, I've looked into it, but I mean, it's, if, if it's five different independent boards, how do you control those? Well, the Clipper, the, the actual firmware is on the Raspberry Pi, right. and then it uses USB to control the uh, Arduinos as basically just set this head to this temperature, move at this rate to this position kind of thing. So it, the, the Raspberry Pi directs the whole system. Okay, so the smartness is happening in the Raspberry Pi, and then those are just like simple slaves. And it looks like it's, it's staying all pretty well in sync. We, we have some sample parts, right? Yes, we do. We have uh, mosaic cells that we've printed. Uh, and they turned out fairly well, I think. Yeah, so these are one, two... These are four colors. Four co I'm, it's, it's late. I'm, I'm failing oh, to count colors fine. here. Fine. We're all tired. <laughs> it's just a classic pot and basically, filament extrusion. How many of those do you have on there right now? We have seven direct drives. Um, so the actual pancake motor and the uh, extruder are in the heads. And then we have two Bowden-fed um, volcanoes right. in terms of print heads. So that's a total of seven print heads. So seven, seven direct drive, nine total, sorry. All right, so nine FDM, FFF uh, tool heads. You've got another one that you showed me yesterday. Can, can we still pull that out? Because that, yeah. that, is, that is a really interesting approach. Thank you. Are you talking about the uh, threaded insert install? Yes, that one. Because that's a process that with the soldering iron is kind of painful to do. So you've, you've kind of worked on that and we're gonna show some, some nice fluffy inserts, some close-ups here. It's uh, basically just a E3D V6 or J head. Um, with a machined aluminum rod in there and an alligator clip, which are going to come up with something better. Um, but the way it works is every time it docks, a uh, threaded insert comes down, a servo pushes it forward into the clip, and then the clip rides up and it pushes it in. So that's part of the docking procedure. It grabs a new insert. That is nice. Because those things, as good as they are, they can be kind of painful to install. And it looks like that's a... I mean, it makes perfect sense in a tool changer, right? Right. You've also got a subtractive head in there. You've got a small uh, brushless outrunner motor with a, with a collet. That's an ER... What, what's the small size on the ER8? Um, the collet size? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Ooh, got that right. Ha. Nice um, and a laser that is... Not powered up. It's not plugged in, which makes a lot of sense for, for for a printer like this. So, what were the big challenges when making a printer that is this large? Because it's I, I feel like it's a bit different from building just a small 20 by 20 printer. It is. The problems that you have are as you're assembling it. Obviously, the things like the belts give it the strength for the core XY gantry, yep. and uh, the the frame gives the gantry support and everything else. So you have to be very careful moving things. And we could not have done worked on it without putting the plywood sides on. For example, yeah. we put the bottom on last because there's no way you can flip the printer um, and have it remain intact without all the sides giving it support. Yeah. So the, the plywood sides are actually giving it support and they're squaring the entire thing up so you, you can adjust it, I guess? Mm -hmm. yeah. Absolutely. At that size of a print area, you're not using a heated bed, I take it? No, we are using a preheated bed. Okay. We have two 140, sorry, two 400 millimeter, 120 volt, um, right. beds, I think out of a Ender 3 Pro, something like that, and they're in the middle of the print area, so the sides are not heated, but the 800 millimeter middle and 400 wide is. Very nice, well, thanks for showing it off. No problem, thank you, Tom. Will of Dice Design. Uh, when I saw these two hot ends on here. I guess that's what they are. Yeah, exactly. The first thing I, th I thought was like, okay, these are these are like scaled up models because you've got them on a fancy light and on a fancy stand. But if you look closer, they're not. The real NEMA 23s, that's the first thing I noticed. And these are, 
these these are hot ends you're selling now. Uh, tell tell me all about them because. It, all right, we're gonna start with the one on the left, on my left. It's called a Typhoon. It's uh, actually a full extruder, not just the odd end. Yep. So it's designed for a 2.85 millimeter filament, and it's designed as uh, actually for uh, super high flow applications. Just like our regular stuff, it's going up to 500 C. It can push out up to one kg uh, of plastic per hour. And uh, basically we wanted to have an all-in-one system that gives you feedback on what you're printing and what's happening while you print. So it's... Right, I call it a hot end, of course, it's both And So is the, what's the other one called? The the one on the right is called the Pulsar. It's okay. a, uh, actually it's not a filament extruder, it's a pellet extruder. So we got rid of the filament. We thought that why not use the pellets themselves and just print them out. Right. So both of these are supposed to go on a 3D printer. This one reminds me of a fill extruder because you feed in the pellets, so if you've got the motor on there, and you've, it's basically, you, you could extrude filament with it, right? If you, if you want to do, yeah, it could do that, sure. Yeah. So, um, what do we see for, for heating here? Because this, this is obviously one of the very unique features of these heaters in here. You're not using heater cartridges. What, what is that and how is that going to work out for, for heating the, the plastic in there? Yeah, so we found that having a longer uh, melt zone was better for a high flow. The thing is, heater cartridge are very, like, uh, they, they heat just a small zone. So we, ha we, we had uh, a bigger area to, to heat and keep warm. So that's why we decided to go with coils instead of just a cartridge. Uh, so the temperature is a lot uh, more stable and uh, the, the, the profile is uh, super, super, super clean. For the Typhoon, I believe it's 400 watts. And the Pulsar, it's double that, 800 watts. And one of the things, of course, that, that I noticed was the heater wire on here. Um, it's not going to stay blank and open like that. It will get some sort of ins insulation on the outside, right? Absolutely, because otherwise it would be too dangerous. I mean, there's a uh, burn risk, uh, there's uh, electricity, uh, like you could get uh, an electrical shock. But for the show purposes, we wanted to show them out and uh, just brag a little bit about it. Yeah, and the... The motors on here are NEMA 23s, yeah. so that they're not like super crazy large uh, on either one. So I guess you could plug that into something like a Duet and just run it off of that board with no issues? Absolutely. We're using Duet right now on both of these. It's uh, actually so easy to set up that, uh, I mean, it's the, it's the way to go. Uh, so basically what we did is just have a gearbox to uh, increase the torque and that's about it. Yeah. So one more thing that I'm noticing is both of these have water cooling. Why, why was that a necessity for you? Uh, well, at first we tried with air cooling, but we noticed that a heat sink needed to cool the, uh, the extruder, the cold part of the system was about the same size as the extruder itself. So it, it, doesn't ma it didn't make any sense. So that's why we decided to go with a water cooling uh, loop that's built inside the uh, extruder. It's more reliable. You can have them in a heated chamber super easily. So it's, it's just no brainer for us. What's the nozzle size on that? Uh, right now we're having a three millimeter nozzle. Wow. Uh, we can have up to five millimeters and maybe more if we find that it needs to be more, you know? Right. So at that scale, like it doesn't matter that a pellet extruder isn't as super precisely controllable as a filament extruder and that maybe you might get some air bubbles here and there. I don't know what, uh, how well you figured this one out. But at that scale, pellets definitely work. There have been some experiments from companies who ended up failing that tried to do like a regular, um, you know, 0.4 millimeter nozzle with pellets that were like lined up and stuff. Yeah. Um, which didn't work. So this is just a regular extrusion screw in there, right? Instead of instead of pushing filament linearly, it's got that that screw in there, right? Absolutely, yes. And uh, oh, like you mentioned, uh, this is not designed for uh, small details and precise uh, prints. Yeah, it needs obviously. to be, yeah. It needs to be a big thing, just like the drums that we did with this thing just a few months back. It needs to be big. It needs to be coarse. And sometimes you don't need that level of details. So one last question, price. How much are these? Because I'm, I'm guessing they're not going to be cheap. Uh, yes, of course, they're not going to be cheap because we're, we're going to supply a lot of electronics to go along with them, a lot of support as well. Okay. Uh, so the Typhoon runs for 2.5K US okay. and the Pulsar runs for, for 6.5K right now. Okay. Uh, these are uh, the beta units and the full production units are, uh, are scheduled to come out later next year. It's nice to have them available, for sure. Absolutely. All right, so thank you for your time. Thank you very much, Tom. 
gcodeme.com. I've been getting that wrong a few times now. I, I've gotten on to you because you've got the malicious G-code check. But first, right. what is what is the website? Yeah. So what we do is we take uh, G-code and 3MF files from customers. And if you would like to upload them, you can put them on our site. So things that are really challenging to slice and get without sort of overhangs and difficult, terrible uh, droppings or anything, you can upload that G-code, add it to our site, with a profile as well, so somebody can take that slicer profile and G-code and print it right away. Yeah, and you've got a database in there that you can search for printer models, filaments. You even can search for specific filament brands Correct. Um, in there. So it's, I mean, we know that sort of approach, G-code uploading, downloading from G, from G-code, from Prusa printers, mm -hmm. um, but you're open to all manufacturers. You're not tied to any of the, the big brands, right? Right, that's correct. Yep, we want to basically have any printer you have, any filament you have, all here in G-code me. So, of course, since you're uploading G-code, one of the big features is the malicious G-code check. So, what are, what are you doing? How are you preventing the same things that I tried to, to exploit on, on Prusa printers. Yeah, so what we have is we kind of have a risk mitigation tactic. So first step is we have a regex check that goes to the entire G-code file, looks for things like M500, I mean, things like uh, writing to EEPROM, you wouldn't want to do that with just a random file you're downloading. So we check for certain G-codes that are just bad, and then the second style, or second method we're blocking malicious G-code is with a visualizer. And the visualizer is going to take some work, but basically we have a layer by layer overview of what your print will be before the print comes out. And then we're going to add other portions to it to basically say this is outside the range of this printer, so this should not be here. We're going to take a look at every printer and put that in the database so it'll check to see if it's out of range. And then we'll add a path value as well, so eventually we'll, we'll have pads in there to see where your nozzle is going to be moving. So. But so far you don't have anything for blobbing or scratching the bed. I guess I guess you could maybe filter it out, but mm -hmm. the, the more advanced uh, you know attacks basically, right. if you can call them advanced, you're not filtering those out yet. Correct, yes. We're working on it though. We started, uh, it's been went live two weeks ago and uh, we've been in production or in development for four months now. So this is not like a paid entry, my mini factory kind of marketplace or anything. It's it's free and what's what's your what's your business model behind that? Yeah, so we'll have some affiliate links and maybe some ads here and there so to keep the lights on for us. And eventually down the line if we get enough G code, we can take and feed a machine learning algorithm to then take that and develop an idea of what's good and bad G code down the line. And then maybe take that and provide it to other companies to filter their G code. Sounds interesting. All right. Thanks for your time. And that is not gcode. Why did you not get gcode.me? I should have done that now that I think about it. But I just thought of like gcode me, man. Send me a gcode. I just thought it was exciting. So, <laughs> all right. So that is gcodeme.com. Thanks for your time.